Hello, darlings. We're super happy to invite you to our short interview with our fantastic guest. She is a lecturer of German and French language as foreign languages and an expert in cultural heritage. So hello, Benedict. Uh, hello. Could you please introduce yourself to get acquaintance with our audience closer? Yes, for sure. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, so yes, I come from France. Um, I was born in the north and I grew up in the south, close to the Mediterranean Sea. And I I tell this detail because I think it's really important um, the um, environment in which a uh, human being evolves might have, uh, you know, some influence later on. So for me, it was very important to see, to be open-minded and to realize, okay, I am in the, in France, but all around the sea, there are many different countries and we have Spain. And then on the other side, you can imagine Africa and different people, different cultures. And uh, I, I believe this is helpful, but you can imagine that I grew up in a very small village actually. And later on, I went uh, for my studies in Toulouse, in the southwest of France. And I always loved uh, foreign languages. So I studied um, French, um, sorry, English and Spanish at school. But then I learned um, Russian and German while actually living in the country and studying in the country. So I think there's a huge difference if you learn a language at home, at school, and you just hear it in the classroom, or if you um, if you learn the language while being in the country. And when you leave the classroom, you have to talk with people in the street when you go to supermarket, if you meet friends. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about uh, me. And um, I yeah, I studied one year in Russia in Moscow and um, it was already 2006 <laughs> some years ago <laughs> and I am based in Berlin in Germany for now um, to 13 14 years yeah <laughs> and I teach uh, German and French in two different schools and I also have some projects related to the field of heritage um, protection of cultural landscapes and so on <laughs> Oh my God, I think that yes. we are super shocked how <laughs> one person can cover a lot of issues like this. Where do you have this energy for all these issues, for all these deals, for all this project, for all of your work? <laughs> I think it's patient, you know, when you are passionate about something, you have the motivation and um I think the the language thing is very important for me because it really enables you to communicate with people. To um, you have it's not only about being able to say hello and to send a message, but it's also getting closer to each other because usually um, there can be barriers uh, when you don't know someone, when you don't know the culture of the other, and then some people are uh, scared or something, but. Um, for me, it's really important when you start learning the language, you, you go to the culture of the other and you get closer to people. And then you, re you realize, OK, we are all living on this earth. We speak different languages, but we are all human beings and we all want to be happy and to care about each other. I think it might be the most important thing to have in mind. And the thing with heritage is very similar, actually, because heritage is something that human beings created and it's very important for them it belongs to their history to who they are to their identity but um you can share it you know it's um it's not like something that i am not related to is not important for me no i believe that okay i didn't know this place before and i'm very happy to discover a new place and while discovering maybe a church or a building or a, a specific um, handicraft, then I also discover the people behind, you know, what they are able to do. Mm. 
Yeah, I think you are absolutely mm -hmm. right. I even couldn't uh, couldn't add anything to your speech. Sharing is caring 100 percent. And now we, mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to fill it, especially. Yeah. So Thank I think you. Uh, if we speak mm -hmm. about languages and history, uh, on my mind, it's interesting to ask uh, what it's like to be bilingual. Uh, as we understand correctly, you know, German, French, Russia, English. Uh, so maybe you have life hacks, life hacks uh, how to learn languages easier. Maybe you have some uh, interesting moments about uh, <laughs> your uh, polingual understanding, something like this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's only an assumption. I cannot be sure, but um, since I was a little girl, I played the piano, you know, and uh, I but I, I really loved it. It was also a passion for me. So I started maybe when I was six years old and every day until I turned 18 and actually lived home to to go uh, left home, sorry, to, to go to my to see to Toulouse to study. I really um, trained every day and it might be that learning a musical instrument, learning music, the melody, it might do something with the brain. I never looked um, in details about this theory, but I think some, some, there is some medical research is about that. So it could be that it helps. And then, um. of course, there is maybe is a talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm not completely sure about that, but um, the thing is, while recording in progress. Oh yeah. Yes, sorry, it seems like we no have problem. some extra problems with uh, all of our sharing video, so I will record it just to be on the safe ground. The war is about. Oh, yeah, sorry, we had okay, We don't have no a video. Problem. I just accepted. Okay. Yes. No, it's not normal. But now you are recording, okay. right? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it's just because of Alexei's problem, as I told you, he has some problems with oh. electricity because yeah, of yeah. night bomb attacks for Ukraine. Yeah, that's why it's not the pleasant situation, but still we're trying to do our best to maintain this process of uh, recording our interviews. Yeah, so yes. no I'm amazed. I'm amazed that you are, you know, doing all of this with the current situation. It's um, you are right. Life must go on, and but you are very. Um, very courageous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. We are, we are super sorry for interrupting yes. you in such no an problem. amazing aspect. No problem. Uh, but yes, the thing with instruments, um, I believe there is a link with uh, learning a musical instrument, being able, you know, to register the brain might get trained to the melody of the languages. I'm not so sure. It's just my, uh, my personal experience. And um, of course, you need a lot of discipline. I remember when I learned um, English and Spanish, um, I, you have to study hard, you know, to learn the vocabulary and it's not always fun, but if you do it regularly, and it's what I say to my students now, you have um, to, to do it maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes a day, but it brings nothing if you don't do anything for the language during weeks and then suddenly you sit for one or two or three hours and you try to get you to work hard on it. It's not so efficient. I think it's really important, may, even if you don't have so much time, but try every day a little bit to learn the vocabulary, to read books, to watch series in the language. That's very helpful. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, you, you're super right. I'm just listening to you and I feel like the pain that you're talking about because I also am trying to learn like the third language for me. Oh, sorry, the fourth language for me. And I know this feeling when you missed uh, like a couple of days and after that you come to this language again and you felt that you you're, you know next to nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's a total pain. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. yeah. But where did you find this passion for learning new, new and new languages? Because as for me, yeah, I know three languages now. And I'm thinking about learning the fourth one. I have already started learning it, but sometimes I have, I felt that I'm burned out and I just don't need this language. No, I don't want to learn anything more. I know English and it's more than enough for me. Please don't touch mm. me. So how, <laughs> how to find this passion, really? 
I think you know that the the funny thing about life something it's something you don't plan you cannot imagine when I was at school for me um in my, I think it's still the same in France right now um you learn English as the first foreign language and then you have to choose a second one and the normal choice for us in France is uh, Spanish German or Italian so um, almost everyone chooses Spanish because Sp Spanish is very much what's widespread in the world and it's also not so difficult for us French people to learn because it's the same Latin roots um, so that's what I did I chose Spanish and never ever in my life I thought I would learn German you know and even teach German <laughs> later on and the same with russian for me it's you know that's just some some things that you cannot plan it's what happened my the first um the first um how how i got a, acquainted with russian language russian culture is through a school exchange i was um 16 and the, a school exchange was organized with my school in france and a school in moscow where they uh, learned the french language but also the history the literature the geography from really small on you know so we french uh, pupils we didn't know a word of russian but the russian students or pupils you know because we were still teenagers when they came to france they were like fluent in french it was so like wow amazing and um the, the friend i received at my home um we understood each other very well you know there was this friendship from the beginning that really um started and then she invited me to her place i didn't know anything about the country before you know geography or history that it's the biggest country in the world, that it's still not that far away from us, but it, that's it, you know? And then I, when I went there, I was completely astonished and amazed. And um, her family, the dad, the mom, the grandma, they are like my family, you know, my, my Russian family now. We have been, we, are, we know each other for more than 20 years and they are very important to me. And she showed me, all of the museums, you know, Moscow, St. Petersburg. And this was a very, like, it's just a personal relationship that I built with another human being. And I was very frustrated because um, her parents seemed so nice. And she was always translating, you know, for me. So she was speaking French and she would translate between Russian and French so that my her parents and me could communicate. And I was a bit frustrated, I must say, because I was like, okay, I don't understand anything. <laughs> and also in the street, I couldn't read anything. And I was like a little bit helpless. And I didn't like this situation. So when I started my studies, there was this option to learn uh, Russian as a third language. You know, that's I studied political sciences and it's just that foreign languages were important. So I, I took this opportunity and I said, okay, now I will learn Russian. And I was 18 when I started to feel like a small kid again because I had to read, to learn how to read, how to write. And it was a very big challenge. It was a very, of course, it's a difficult language for anyone coming from uh, European countries where we have the Latin alphabet and we don't have all of these uh, declinations, the uh, padiegi. <laughs> it's um, for us, it's hard, but I don't regret because it made the opportunity for me with my studies one year and then I could speak with her family and I got closer to the culture through the way that I could be able to speak the language then. And I made a similar experience with German because I moved to Berlin after the studies when I finished for personal reasons, but I couldn't speak German very well. So I started to go to some language schools in the city. And during the day, I was also talking in the street with people. And it was the same, you know, it's like, okay, well, try it hard. But when you have to, just to try to answer your question, in for Russian, it was my very, very personal motivation to be able to communicate with people I appreciated. And German was like, okay, I live in this country and I don't have any other choice. I have to. And that's how it worked, you know, and I can remember that 
I'm frustrated with my Spanish because I never speak Spanish and I know it's somewhere completely passive in my brain. But of course, if I try to speak Spanish, sometimes it's just Russian words that come, you know, and I'm like, no, that's not Spanish. <laughs> but the, it's a magical thing about the brain, I'm sure. If you learn a language, it's never a waste of time. It doesn't matter if you use it every day or if you have learned it, it's so storage somewhere. And anytime, if you want to activate it, if you have the opportunity because of a, an, a, an internship or for vacations or for a job, if you go to the country after maybe one week, it starts to be activated again. And that's the a wonderful thing <laughs> yeah okay thank you for sharing I, I see that's fire in your eyes and yeah <laughs> i'm super i'm super happy that you shared with me your secrets of how to learn languages a little easier i think that it will help a lot of our viewers as well so we have one more suggestion for you a lot of people they compare ukrainian language with french language because it's also really melodical language like music you know all the sounds and we have a lot of uh, consonants and vowels especially in our world so do you have a passion to learn the ukrainian language <laughs> we can invite <laughs> you in the natural environment <laughs> that would be the next challenge and i love challenges so why not <laughs> i'm at would be very i have also ukrainian friends you know who speak either um but usually both languages, but sometimes for them, it's uh, Ukrainian's uh, native uh, speaking language. And uh, so I, I lived actually with um, a friend of mine from Ukraine in Berlin. She was my, my flatmate for one year. So I could hear some, um, some Ukrainian. And it was very interesting for me that we tried, you know, just to see if I could understand. So she would speak with me in Ukrainian and I would be like, okay, because she could speak Russian as well. So, and German. So sometimes no, our normal language communication was German between us. But um, sometimes we tried just to play, you know, to see, can I understand anything at all? <laughs> so, yeah. Why not? <laughs> language uh, for visiting Ukraine. But it's not a problem even if you don't know Ukrainian language because a lot of people in Ukraine, they also can speak English fluently. So it's not a problem, but it's a language. Yeah, I also absolutely love it. And yeah. Yes, I always yes. speak about... I, have uh, been, I was amazed because... Sorry. Yeah, okay. It's okay, continue. Sorry. No. It's not... It's no, just no, an issue I, it, with Alexei's internet connection. Yes. We have some delays because yes, of Yes, uh, for sure. No, I just wanted to say that, uh, yes, I, I the, all the Ukrainians I met uh, can speak very well English, actually, because, I mean, in Berlin, I met more Ukrainians in the last um, months, and also I taught German to Ukrainians, and I was really amazed that the level of English is really high. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I want to ask about you another sphere yes. of work. We uh, hear that you are an expert of world heritage. So, could you introduce yeah, mm -hmm. we uh, could you introduce to us this uh, sphere of your work, please? Ye yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and that's uh, the funny part about it because um, I until now we really focused on foreign languages, and it's um, one part of what I do for a living and one of my patients. But the other half is linked to heritage. And um, it's also the same what I told you with um, Russian and German languages. It's sometimes life can be very surprising. And so, as I said, I was um, I studied political sciences in Toulouse and one year in Moscow. And I didn't have anything to do at that point with heritage. But um, during this year in Russia, I used the chance to travel. And I spent some days in Kazan. Um, uh, and then I discovered the Kazan Kremlin that was part of UNESCO. But the first, and I, I didn't know anything, so I got to learn everything on while I was you know visiting as a tourist <laughs> and I was just very surprised to see a um, brand new mosque you know Moshe within the Kremlin close to the um, Orthodox uh, Cathedral and that this was part of UNESCO that was a big question for me so when I came back to Toulouse to continue my studies, I decided to write my master thesis on the Kazan Kremlin to try to understand what um, 
what happened how could it be um, inscribed on the unesco world heritage list under which criteria and uh, what was uh, this idea of um you know with the rebuilding the, the brand new mosque that had been destroyed many centuries ago by uh, ivan grozny and um, was it something political the will to re-establish the um, tatar identity so that's the very first step how i got into heritage and it was in uh, 2007 i think so my master thesis I wrote it in French, so but it's available online. And uh, but well, <laughs> and after that, um, I had the chance to to make an internship um, in at the time. Now it's closed, but they used to have um, UNESCO office in Moscow. So I was there for four months in two thousand nine. Um, and we had uh, some projects in five countries. This little office um, organized was representative for Russia, um, Belarus, Moldova, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So I was working in the sector sector of culture, and we had different projects. And um, while I was in Moscow, um, I met the president of Ecomos Russia. I don't know in which. To which extent you are familiar with UNESCO, but um, ICOMOS, it's uh, the International Council on Monuments and Sites. So there is ICOMOS International with headquarters close to Paris, but there are um, ICOMOS um, in each country or om almost each country of the world. And they are the um, advisory body uh, for UNESCO, for the World Heritage Committee, when they decide to inscribe new sites on the World Heritage List, they give their opinion. So they are experts in the field. And um, while I was doing my internship in Moscow, I, went, I met uh, the president of Ecomos Russia, and we spoke uh, quite a long time because I also met him one year before when I was doing my master thesis with, Ka with uh, Kazan. Um, so I interviewed him for my research and then he came back from Spain where there was, you know, the World Heritage Committee meetings uh, takes place every year in a different city, in a different country. And they meet during 10 days and there they decide to inscribe new sites or to put some sites on the list of World Heritage in danger. Or they also decide to delist um, sites from the World Heritage list if they don't um, have the criteria anymore, you know, the outstanding universe value. I'm going into very um, technical details. I hope it's not too much information. No, <laughs> but... no, no, no. It's super interesting. It's super interesting. I also wanted to ask you like a supportive question mm -hmm. about the Latin, some cultural objects from a cultural heritage. How do you feel about it? It sounds yeah. like a little bit awful when you have been thinking for a lot of time that, okay, this place, that site is important for all the culture all over the mm -hmm. world. And now we just need to delete it from our mind. How can it be possible? I know. <laughs> so that's why I'm telling you all these details, because you will see. That's why I was telling you, like, in a way, everything is a domino game. Like, you cannot plan in advance what will happen in your life. But because of this meeting with this president of Ecomos Russia, where he came back from Spain after the community meeting, he explained to me about a site that just got delisted. And this site is in Germany. It is in the city of Dresden. It, it was the Dresden Elbe Valley. It was a cultural landscape. And when he tell, told me about it, I felt really like, oh my God, what happened? I didn't know this is actually possible. And this kept was just I kept this in my mind and when I moved to Germany one year later I found out about a PhD program and I applied to this PhD program with the topic of the delisting of the Dresden Elbe Valley so actually <laughs> I researched for four years the case of this delisting and I wrote my PhD in English so if you really are interested into this topic, you can um, check my PhD thesis is online. It's in English. And I also wrote some smaller scientific articles, you know, maybe just five, 10, 15 pages. And the thing is, so yes, it is possible to delist, <laughs> but he, I mean, 
the World Heritage Program exists already since 1972. And the very first time that a site got delisted was um, in the beginning of the two, 2000, 2005, I think, um, if I'm not wrong. And it was a site in Oman, a natural site. But the state party, the political authorities, um, asked for the delisting because it was a place where they could, it was a very big national park, you know, a huge area that was protected as a natural site on the World Heritage List. But they, uh, they discovered they had hydrocarburos on the, um, on the place. So they would have to reduce um, from 90% of the uh, protected area to be able to extract uh, their oil and everything. So they knew it wouldn't be compatible, but they preferred to lose the status. Um, so to so to say to stop protecting this site for economical reasons, and the UNESCO committee was very astonished because this is not the way it's working normally. But well, they had to accept um, the will of the state party, so they said, "Okay, we delist you," and this opened the door, I would say, to delistings. So um, Dresden was listed in two thousand four. Um, and because of the construction of a bridge in the middle of um, the protected site, it lost the status. And then it got delisted in 2009. But it was a conflict because Germany, as a state party, didn't want the site to be delisted. Of course, they wanted to find another solution, which they couldn't. So this was 2009. And now Liverpool just got delisted. You know, the Liverpool in, in UK... Um, the waterfront was protected and a kind of a similar situation like with Dresden. There was a development project, a very big, um, a new project called Water, um, yeah, uh, Liverpool Waters. And for UNESCO, that was not compatible with uh, the values of the site. So after maybe 10 years of negotiations, of sending experts, trying to discuss, um, they just delisted uh, Liverpool last year. So now we are maybe, I don't think there are 2,000 sites on the list. I, I don't know uh, the exact number of sites actually on the list, but uh, this, we could Google this if necessary. But at least there are three sites that got delisted so far. Oh, mm -hmm. here we have a, yeah. a, a question from our viewers. So yes. uh, one of them asking about, uh, can our guest tell us about cultural heritage places in Ukraine? So maybe you know something about... Ah. Yeah. <laughs> this is also, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, some years ago, I worked um, for a very tiny travel agency a German travel agency that was specialized in Ukraine. And my duties were to translate all the um, activities and the locations from German to French because they wanted to also send French tourists uh, to Ukraine. So I, I got acquainted with uh, some places in Lviv, in Kiev, um, some monasteries, but I'm, the, I'm bad with ge geography and because I didn't have the chance yet to visit your country, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to uh, locate um, exactly, but I know that there are a lot of uh, world heritage sites in Ukraine. Um, and um, you also have a very beautiful nature, very, very important, beautiful landscapes, also the Carpathians and um, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> I just know about, you know, some, I have some images of some very important cathedrals, mainly monasteries, uh, yeah, city uh, centers. Yeah, SOPT, uh, many of our cultural objects were destroyed during the war by the Russia side. So. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a huge problem because they don't pay any attention on our cultural objects like it should be according to all the legal documents. And a lot of our natural heritage objects are destroyed in Ukraine by this Russian bombs and just by their truths. And how to protect your cultural objects and your cultural heritage in this way? Maybe do you have... This is just like, I can only compare the emotions that we felt when Notre Dame, Sacré Coeur in Paris, burnt, you know, there was all over the world a huge emotion for this uh, cathedral. So I can imagine what is happening right now. Um, and it's all in many places in the country and it's uh, getting lost. And it's, it's a very, for me, it's... Um, you can feel, um, I'm always very passionate, but I, I have a lot of emotions and I am very, very, very upset. Um, 
because of what is going on right now, but also in general in the world. It's like, it's not possible. We have agreements, we have conventions, international conventions. We have so many um, possibilities to, you know, just to save the heritage. We, we also um, organize awareness raising programs all over the world for young people, for uh, politicians for everyone and I believe it's absolutely not acceptable that anywhere in the world all of these treasures that belongs to all of the humanity are getting lost this is just not possible for me and then it fa it feels very very frustrating that um, when experts when people in, at UNESCO you know officials um, are trying to do some things but it's it's not enough somehow, or it will not, it's not getting heard, you know, that's, um, it's a very tough job, because if you love what you do, and you want to protect, you know, you believe in what you do, and you see that it's, people don't rec respect it, this is not okay, this is really not okay, so, um, I, I have no idea, and the only thing I can say is that, um, in the course of history, there have been a lot of damages. Sometimes it's a fire, sometimes it's a war, and so many historic places had to be reconstructed. And of course, you lose the authenticity if you have a place that was here for 500 years or even more, you know, and then it's completely lost and you have to rebuild it it's very very tough but at least the only maybe positive point because i i like to remain optimistic and also give you the you know the um the courage to go on with what you do because it's amazing what you are creating right now is that you need archive you need a lot of archives a lot of pictures and today we have this chance to be in the digitalized world that all the videos you make about your heritage you are saving your heritage somehow you know i mean i i can understand that it might be a bit like weird because it's no, I know it would be only digital, but you are um, helping people to raise their awareness about the importance to save these places, you know. And um, so um, I can just, you know, tell you, go on, do, do all of these videos. This is wonderful, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, thank you for recommendation. Let's mm. just, uh, yeah, let's just step back of uh, all of this uh, awful ideas and information. Maybe you heard about it, maybe no. Uh, in other Ukrainian culture, we have a special natural um, dish that is called borscht. And uh, yes. recently, the process of cooking borscht was yes. identified like uh, intangible cultural heritage of UNESCO. Uh, have you ever heard anything about it? Okay, wow. Yeah, that's great because um no, I didn't I didn't know it was um put on the intangible um list and uh, intangible cultural heritage list. I know that in the last last years a lot of uh, traditional dishes got listed from different countries or some uh, uh, specific um, ways of cooking something, you know, okay. But I was not aware about borscht and I always um, ate borscht in Russian, but um, I know that there are some differences between the Ukrainian borscht and the um, Russian borscht. Is it right? It, there are some differences in the ingredients or the way you prepare it? Yeah, of course. Uh, there mm -hmm. are a lot of serious uh, differences in both in ingredients and in the way of cooking. And we also have a kind of like joke in Ukraine that, yeah, we know that uh, it was uh, identified like uh, cultural heritage, but every householder, every woman in Ukraine uh, cooks borscht just where its uh, internal recipe. So, yes. and this recipe was created like step by step during a lot of years of history. So, we don't know mm -hmm. for sure which borscht actually is intangible cultural heritage because everybody <laughs> cooks their own borscht, you know. <laughs> yes, but um, I'm if you if you take a critical look at uh, what is going on, I'm I I. I 
I'm not an expert on intangible cultural heritage, but um, of course, it's also interesting for me. And uh, I, I, during my PhD thesis, we were 10 students all uh, working together at the same time. It was very structured. We met each other. We had research colloquiums and so on. And uh, some of my friends were really um, focusing on intangible cultural heritage. And what I can tell is I'm a bit surprised about uh, the, the this wall um a new thing about all the dishes, you know, I also heard about the French baguette, you know, this uh, bread, typical bread that we have. I don't understand. I don't really, I, for me, it's um, intangible cultural heritage is okay. It's, it's maybe a song. It's maybe a, a music, a dance. Um, it's an artifact, a, a very, a traditional way of doing something that also might get endangered. You know, some very specific um, languages, um, we have in France a very small island called Corsica. It's in the Mediterranean Sea above Sardinia. This is, Sardinia is Italian, but Corse is French, Corsica. And in um, on this very small island, there is um, there are the mountains and you have a very specific, I, I cannot remember right now uh, the name, but uh, it's only men who can sing a very specific way of singing in in churches or during ceremonies and it's like all not together but maybe in one and then the second and then the third one and it's very very impressive and very beautiful but it is endangered because young people are leaving the island they are leaving these small uh, villages and they are trying to save this tradition so this i can understand that it is part of the list but uh, if we talk about um Yes, food and as you say, where is the authenticity? Because we you you don't we don't know what kind of borscht, as you say, every family has maybe this tiny secret ingredient that makes a difference. <laughs> so well, yeah, I am a bit skeptical about the whole food thing. <laughs> yes. Okay, Being so uh, if we talk about world heritage, I would ask you an interesting question. Yes. Is it the same because of me? So as an expert of world heritage, what places you can recommend to visit to understand uh, maybe the scale of the heritage of human civilization? As for me, it's, I think it's Petra complex in uh, Nabatea, or it's in old uh, name, or today it's Jordania, if I, if I right remember, or Saudi Arabia. I don't, I don't know correctly, but mm -hmm. I, I think Arabia. Yes, yes, yes. I think any any place. Well, um, it's very tough because you know if this uh, this question is very good and at the same time very very hard to uh, to give an answer to because um, it would say that we we value you know we make a ranking of, of which place is um, better or something like that but it's not really the case and I maybe I have two points to which I can understand. Mm, to um, to try to reply to this question. So the first one would be, if we really check the list, if you are very interested into the world, uh, world heritage listing process, if you go back to the very early years of the listing, uh, let's say the convention was um, adopted in 1972, and I think just a few years later, they started their uh, yearly meetings in which they inscribed new sites. So of course, Let's see, during the 1970s, 1980s, the most iconic places of the world got inscribed. So if you look at that, then you will have already a list, already an answer. Probably the pyramids in Egypt, um, probably Machu Picchu in Peru, you know, some of these, uh, or maybe in India, um, the Taj Mahal. I don't know. We can imagine all of this. But um, um, of course... Any place, may it be recognized as UNESCO or not, any historical place is heritage, you know, and uh, and then you go there and um, it doesn't matter in which country you are, I think the most interesting is to see, okay, who built this, we, 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 what are the uh, cultural influences, you know, because it's not, okay, this place has been built in this country, but there might be some influences of architects uh, from neighborhood countries, or maybe that was a movement of the century, you know, so it's so much behind, and how many people worked on it, how did they work on it to build the place, and then to, to keep it as it is, to safeguard it, and also the 
other important point is what are the uses and functions of the place today? You know, because um, it's important what people today do with the place. You know, if it's a church, is it still in function? If it's, um, I don't know, um, a, a castle, what is happening in the castle right now, or a fortress, or is it just a ruin? Is it used for tourism? Or are there people living in there? Um, you know, the relation of the people to their place, that's interesting for me. Mm. About the castle, I hear as a project in France that some people rebuild the medieval castle from the with the medieval technologies. Maybe in in it's in in Rouen, uh, as I correctly remember, but I don't really know. Yes, I think you're right. I'm not so familiar with this project, but I heard about it, and I think some schools, some uh, pupils or students um, take part in the project. So maybe on a uh, on a pedagogical. Um, you know, aspect, it's interesting. Um, yeah, why not? But then, I mean, um, of course, if you really speak as an expert, if you want to, the, this this thing about authenticity, that's a very, very complex issue. Authenticity, you know, it's authenticity in the material. Do you use the same material as it was built before? Do you create something completely new? Or, you know, it's always this balance, like not to try to make postiche, like a fake uh, um, remake of something that was before. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. But all of these projects are interesting. I think the most important is to try to, um, because it, it can be that from the, for the wider public, you know, sometimes heritage looks something like, you know, old and uh, not so attractive. And that's why probably that's interesting when they do these projects with students or pupils to, to see that, no, 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 it belongs to our culture. It also belongs to you and you can be part of it and you can be active in the field. So, mm. yeah, okay, we are super interested in one more question. Uh, yes. Could you please share what world heritage means to you and what is your role as an expert? Like, what do you usually do? How do you usually work on world heritage? Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> so, for me, um, I, I'm always very, um, like a child always very admirative of this program because when i when i look at the roots of the origins can you imagine that almost all the countries of the world are part of this convention that's something big you know it's it's hard to have such a big consensus so you can really say it's completely international and it's really brave to try to initiate such a program and the origin of this program this convention was to protect heritage where it might be endangered because it would be a way to give a state party, so a country, a state party to the convention, you know, the possibility to preserve the heritage if maybe the country itself don't have enough um, resources to do it. May it be financial or another kind, you know. So the idea of this convention was to protect heritage at the international level so that um, anyone in the world can enjoy this heritage and belong, relate to it, maybe visit it or whatever. And this, this primary ID is great, amazing. But what I, um, in the last years, I became a little bit um, frustrated maybe, or um, I took more distance with the whole pro program because I, I see a sort of um, politicization in the whole process, you know, because this program is actually now being, um, um, how do you say this? You know, that they, it's like, it was so famous that actually now it's getting an inconvenient to be so famous, you know. Um, we have been saying um, uh, to be like, um, to be like the, your own, the own, um, injured maybe of your fame or something in in this direction i want to explain why i say that it's just that if you try to list a site on the world heritage list is because you believe that this site is of international importance that the whole international community can relate to the place can identify to the place so then you say okay i want it to be internationally protected so i'm sure nothing can happen to the site but it's not 
um, an economical advantage, you know. Now, in, in theory, this just gives you the possibility to be recognized internationally and protected internationally, point. But the thing is, now, so, so many years, um, the whole program is being very, very successful because people, politicians, or, or other kind of authorities realized Oh, being inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site brings tourism, brings economy. You know, I can also understand this part, but you have to do it in a in the proper way. So now I have the feeling it's the rush to inscribe um, in order to get these, you know, incomes then. But it's not really anymore about the site itself, I think, because if you look at the list now, you can be very skeptical on some places. Um, and um, then you can see that, unfortunately, if you check the decisions, how people in the World Heritage Committee decide to inscribe a site or not to inscribe it, the arguments are not always very technical. You can imagine that it's a game, you know, of, okay, it may be in the corridor, I would say, because officially they cannot say it, all the meetings are recorded. This is what I don't like. And um, in the last years, I I worked on some nomination dossier, you know, because uh, it's a lot of work when you want to inscribe a new site. So I did this. I also worked on um, pedagogical projects, maybe, you know, this uh, program Erasmus+. Plus. So it's linked to heritage, but um, more to um, trying to, organize some training in the field or um, I also did some um, um, I was part in the jury um, yeah I'm like in sort of jury panel um, you probably know Europa Nostra and uh, the European uh, cultural um, you know label uh, so it's it's something different it's not UNESCO but it's really within uh, Europe there's also some programs uh, related to heritage so I was just um, being part of a team that um, we we evaluated um, a project it was the sister Cians, um, so it was related with different countries in Europe, um, with some sister Cians uh, monasteries, you know. So it's very, very wide what I can do, and what I love to do usually is to um, kind of give some, try to to share my knowledge about. UNESCO with students. So um, every year I go to Dresden, to, to Germany, to my to the place actually of my research for my PhD. And I, t I, I make an excursion with master students in world heritage about this case. So I can explain them the whole story and we, we can see the site itself, you know, the river, the landscape, the city, so they can better understand what was happening with them, um, what I told you earlier on during the interview. So I love being in contact with um, young people and, um, um, you know, just to, when I see patients, you know, when I see like they, they would like to do something in the field, so I try to just, yeah, say, okay, this is what I did and that's what I know and I'm always happy to to also hear what is their opinion and to share what we what we think, what can we do better? And I really have a lot of hopes maybe for the future with future generations that um, to, 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 to reflect on what is going on with the World Heritage List, with UNESCO, and what can we do um, to really protect our heritage and develop other kind of projects so that we get connected, you know, and uh, try to, yeah, there are many ideas, many things to do. <laughs> Okay, so it's very interesting. And uh, if you tell uh, us about countries, there about connection between countries, uh, cultural con cultural connections, uh, also. So, what uh, your favorite country to live in? So you lived in France, uh, now in Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, many different countries. So, uh, what maybe uh, favorite country you can say about it? <laughs> it's a very tough question. <laughs> okay. Well, of course, France is um, is my country. I'm French. It's my language. It's my culture. So um, I feel comfortable. But um, I 
I love, yes, the way, the savoir vivre, you know, the savoir vivre, this art of vivre, the way people are maybe relaxed and like to cook and to enjoy the moment with the family, with the friends. This, this kind of thing I, I really like, um, but it's in me and I can do it anywhere I live. I don't have to be in the country to, to continue living this way. Um, what I really like about Germany and especially Berlin is this um, internationality. You know, you find almost all of the countries within the city and um, there's a lot of tolerance, a lot of open mindedness, you know, so um, you see a lot of different people, different cultures and everyone seem to live with each other in a very peaceful way. And that's what I love about this city. Um, and also it's very green. So it's a capital city, but uh, you have a lot of green areas and it's not so um, condensed, you know. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, I feel good in Berlin. And I would say at the moment, that's where I like to be, you know, in Germany and especially Berlin. Um, I loved being in Russia as well, but it was when I was a student and I loved the, all the adventures because it's not a place where you are, you cannot get bored like France or Germany where, you know, everything is so stable somehow. Or when you have to go through administrative things, okay, you know how it is. But for me, it was a big adventure to be in Russia and to try to understand how works the system and, um, and, trying to yeah to learn and to be um, with people but yeah i wouldn't live there anymore <laughs> <laughs> i think many of many of uh, foreign students uh, say like this so and uh, i think the final question yes. and we uh, okay yes. and we uh, Okay, can finalize our interview. So, what associations do you have mm -hmm. with Ukraine, our country? So, maybe except of war, uh, except of this negative, uh, so, uh, except of the negative peculiarities of our country that we have today. Mm -hmm. I didn't get your question properly. What was the? Uh, what do uh, what associations do you mm -hmm. have with Ukraine? So, what uh, oh, what do you yes. associate what associate yes. you with Ukraine? Yes, well, um, friends that I have, that I know the country through the friends I met, um, open-minded people, um, a very rich degree of, uh, in terms of heritage, in terms of uh, nature, um, a very, um, a very European country, and at the same time, very uh, with a very specific culture. I think I. Unfortunately, I, I I would like to know more about your history, you know, but what I know is that like any country in the world, I believe um, there are a lot of influences from uh, neighbor, uh, neighboring countries through history. So it might be the specificity of your identity, your culture, you know. So I am very curious to know more. But the associations that I make, yeah, it's um, Orthodox churches, um it's um the the typical uh, traditional uh, dresses i think um and yeah the the food and yes mm. but for me it's um i i i associate ukraine uh, a lot with russia as well you know as a as a maybe western european person you know all the interconnections that there are all the uh, the families, you know, the, like a, like a sister country. I don't know, you know. It's I don't want to say things that are that are not uh, correct, but it's just my association. I always believe that there is a very strong interconnection historically between both countries, although they are two different separate countries with differences in the cultures and uh, the history. But there's a link, yeah. Mm. Okay, so I think uh, we can finalize our interview. We can thank uh, our <laughs> guests. It's about you. We can thank our viewers about interesting questions. Uh, I think we have questions in the comments after the publishing stream. Uh, so maybe <laughs> you answer it on the second uh, meeting. If we have it, I think we have it. So yes, 
Yeah, yes, so we, we, uh, yeah. Me, we also. It's just a hint for you that we want to invite you to talk even more <laughs> because one hour it's not enough for us. We want to <laughs> dig a little bit deeper because, yeah, actually mm -hmm. it's really interesting and vital topic. And I think that we have just not enough time to talk about <laughs> it. But uh, don't worry, you can, of course, I can imagine there might be some questions uh, arising later on. So you have my email address, uh, we are in contact and I, I'm more than happy to send you some links um, or to uh, to reply to your question. We can keep in contact and um, thank you so much for inviting me and um, yeah, go on, continue what you do. That's really great. You know, you're doing a great job. Mm. So, okay, uh, we see our guest uh, in our project and in YouTube, I think, uh, on the next uh, on the next week. So, bye. <laughs> yeah, bye. thank you for joining <laughs> us one more time. Send in your meal and kisses for joining us. Have a good holiday. Finally, thank just you. relax without <laughs> work. <laughs> and thank come back so with a new energy. Okay. Yes, yes, always. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye, see <laughs> you. Thank you. Recording stopped.